Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Kale. I'm the video producer for Jacobin. And welcome to another Jacobin Talk. Um, every week at 6 PM on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we've been hosting a left-wing thinker to talk about an important political issue. And today is no different. But before I introduce tonight's guests, along with a special guest host, uh, I just want to briefly plug that on Friday, we're going to be doing a special 10-year anniversary show. While the YouTube channel is less than a year old, the namesake publication has been around for 10 years, stretching all the way back to the Occupy days. Uh, luckily, the magazine doesn't embody the politics of Occupy, but perhaps a talk for another time. But um, anyways, Friday should be fun. I hope you all tune in. And on Saturday, we have another episode of our weekend show with Anna Kasparian and Nando Vila. This week's guest is professor of law and history at Yale and the former and a former Jacobin talk speaker, Sam Moyne, uh, to discuss the politics surrounding the Supreme Court. He recently said in a Jacobin article that, uh, quote, the sobering thing I hope Americans take from this result is that we've made a court so powerful that we've converted the politics of democracy too often into referendums on who makes it onto this council of elders. And so I think on that note, it's worth introducing uh, our speakers tonight. Joining us is Thomas Frank. He's a journalist and a prolific writer. Um, his previous two books, What's the Matter with Kansas and Listen Liberal, uh, have been essential texts over the years. And I expect that his new book, uh, The People Know, good uh, play on words, uh, I expect that it's going to prove as, to be so as well. Um, and uh, a good friend of mine recently remarked that these days he only gets excited for newly published pieces of writing from a select number of writers. And he said that Thomas Frank is very much at the top of that list. And I completely agree with him. Um, and so everyone should go buy the book, read the book, at the very least, listen to the talk tonight, and then buy the book. Um, also joining us is a Jacobin contributor and who I'd like to think of as a rising young scholar in populism, Anton Yeager. Uh, Anton's written a number of pieces over the years on this. Uh, probably most importantly, recently within this year, he and his co-author Arthur uh, Brillio, hope I'm saying his name right, uh, just published a piece, a piece in Jacobin, or not Jacobin, a catalyst called Making Sense of Populism. It's a very amorphous graphic for a rather amorphous topic. Uh, so they're going to talk. <laughs> they're going to talk for a little over a half hour, and then Anton is going to be taking questions from you, the audience. So please hit like, please hit subscribe, and uh, please share the video with your friends. And thank you. Take it away, Anton. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Thanks so much for this introduction. Um, so, Thomas, we obviously have a lot to talk about. There's so much in the book. I'm not quite sure uh, where I'm supposed to start, certainly because I came to populism from a more academic standpoint. But what's so extraordinary about the book, I think, is that you have a capacity to synthesize and condense very, very highfalutin and complex academic arguments into very, very plainly written uh, political analyses. But actually, I just want to start with a more contemporaneous or contemporary question is, why did you feel you had to book, uh, write this book in this year? Of course, there's a presidential election coming up, probably in a, in a month and a half. Uh, was the timing that deliberate that it would come out just before this presidential election? And do you feel that Americans need this book more uh, today than they did ever before? Hell yes, they do. <laughs> they got yeah, but it it was supposed to come out in March. The uh, what happened was the you know COVID came along and that 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 uh, delayed the publication of it somewhat. So uh, you know I started on it what two years ago, and what what made me start working on it was the sort of um, rampant abuse uh, of the word populism, you know, at the hands of, uh, uh, you know, commentators, the sort of, uh, uh, commentariat or what, what, what would you, what, what, what do you call them? The, um, the sort of, uh, pundit bureau here in America, you know, the, these, uh, these people who write about everything and they always have the exact same opinion one to from one from another. And, uh, they started using the word populism in the most, as a, as a, as a, as a as after Trump got elected as a synonym for uh, racist demagogue. And, you know, look, all, all my life, the word populism has been used um, 
all in all sorts of, of unusual ways, but but to see them all suddenly decide that that was the correct definition of it, that was too much for me. <laughs> I knew I had to write the book then, and so that was the starting point. But that that's not the ending point. What uh, it, because along the way, of course, uh, as as you you've read the book, so you know, I uh, I sort of stumbled upon something really really interesting, even more interesting than populism itself, which is uh, the phenomenon of anti-populism, people who hate uh, populist movements and who imagine, you know, that uh, that that uh, when ordinary people get involved in democracy, it, you're automatically on some kind of slippery slope to, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to madness and demagoguery. Yeah, perfect. Um, so if we want to talk about anti-populism, uh, and you give a sort of long history of anti-populism from the late 19th century to today, we obviously have to start with populism itself and when the word was invented and why yeah. the word was invented in the first place. So I was wondering whether you could tell us anything about the period in the late 19th century, mainly in America, in which this word was first launched and why when we see people use the word today or people who are familiar with that period in American history, have such a sense of culture shock when they're confronted with these. Yeah, like, that, it, that, uh, thank you, Anton. And I like the way you put that because th uh, sometimes I wonder if it's just a Midwestern thing. So I was, fr I'm, you know, from Kansas originally, and you know, it's not like um, I'm proud of being from Kansas or anything. It's just where I happen to grow up, and uh, you know, you have a sense of of the, uh, you know, you have an idea of the past and that sort of thing, but. Uh, there is that element to it. So uh, populism is one of the very, very small number of things that Kansas can boast about having given the world, you know, this word. They, uh, they made it up in the year 1891, and it was uh, the, the word populism. It was meant to describe supporters of a uh, third party movement, a sort of radical left wing third party movement, the um, it was it, it called the populist movement. It was a sort of coalition between farmers and um, uh, workers, you know, industrial union members and various other reform groups of the period. But it was mainly a farmer group, uh, hence Kansas. Farmers are obviously very important in Kansas. And they uh, it's the last great third party movement in American history. Uh, and anyhow, it, uh, uh, in 1890, they came out of nowhere to sort of uh, upset the local Republican Party. Kansas, uh, in those days, as, is, as it is today, was a one-party Republican state. And uh, uh, they basically took the legislature away from the Republicans. It's a complete shock and a surprise. And uh, the next year, they had to come up with a – they were trying to come up with a name for, you know, supporters of, the, of, their, of their group – and populist is the word they came up with, uh, which they derived from the Latin word uh, "populus," meaning people. Anyhow, the uh, People's Party, the uh, the populist movement, it's not a. Uh, what I've discovered since this book came out is that it's actually not a very well known chapter of American history. It's pretty much um, forgotten or misunderstood, um, and the 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 facts of the you know the the sort of basic outline of what happened to the populist party uh, is actually kind of interesting because people don't know the story. Should I, should I go into it? Yeah, it would be good to give everyone a small crash course. I think some Americans might be more familiar with the story than Europeans, but still, as you say, even Americans sometimes have been completely shut off from this history. So it's always really interesting to see what it actually looked like. And I think the real question is, you describe the populists as a radical movement, but why precisely were they so radical in the late 19th century? So okay. what was so deep about the challenge they posed to America? You see, my glasses are crooked. <laughs> They're a radical movement. Yeah, they, uh, it, it was, uh, farmers had been, ha you know, had been having a, a, a very difficult time uh, all through the 1880s. Prices for farm stuff, you know, for, the, for what they produced kept dropping and dropping. They discovered that they were in the grip of these monopolies, uh, you know, uh, railroads in particular, uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, they, they were particularly uh, subject to the, the, you know, the whims of, of, of banks. Uh, and uh, 
And then, of course, you had the problem of currency deflation. The U.S. was on the gold standard at the time. And what that meant is that the money uh, got more and more valuable every year as the population of the country increased. And it, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated issue, but we don't need to go there. But basically, the, the, what, you were, what they had in the 1890s was called deflation. It's the opposite of inflation. Money becomes more valuable all the time. And this is, very, this is really bad if you are somebody who... Uh, who, who, who borrows money as a part of your livelihood, which farmers did. So these, these people were, their lives were uh, getting worse and worse and worse all the time. This is an enormous part of the population of America. I mean, they're more than half of the population in the 1890s. And uh, they join up with a group called the Farmers Alliance, which is uh, very similar to what today they call the Farmers Union. Uh, they join the Farmers Alliance. They start uh, getting together, holding these meetings, trying to figure out what they can do about their situation. And eventually they decide, you know, they, they uh, the Farmers Alliance publishes all of these pamphlets, the, all of these newspapers get started, uh, and they decide to go into politics. And their politics are pretty radical. They're, uh, you know, they do, they're demanding currency reform. They're demanding that the government uh, uh, start various farm programs. They want uh, economic policy of the United States to be made uh, with the interests of ordinary people in mind, which is, you know, shocking at the time because uh, uh, economic policy of the United States is made, <laughs> of course, with, with the uh, interests of the very wealthy in mind at the time. They wanted the government to nationalize railroads and then they wanted a whole bunch of political reforms to crack down on corruption because the 1890s, much like today, was a time of rampant political corruption, a time of uh, towering inequality, which goes hand in hand with political corruption. And uh, they wanted votes for women, among other things. They wanted the secret ballot, um, you know, various reforms like that. They wanted to crack down on lobbying, all of these sorts of things. So it was a pretty left-wing party by the standards of the day. And uh, what's funny is it doesn't seem all that radical anymore because most of the things that they wanted eventually came to pass. We did eventually get off the gold standard. We regulated the banks. We regulated the railroads. Women got the right to vote. Uh, right down the list. They were very successful in that regard, but they were not successful as a third party. They, uh, they wound up eventually, um, their, li they, their, their life as a third party was very short. Uh, they lasted mm. about six or seven years and then... Um, basically fell apart. Yeah, so I think the book does a really impressive job of showing how even though the electoral successes of populism in the 1890s uh, weren't that impressive, or when you look at it from a distance, it looked like they failed. When you see it in a sort of long-term perspective, you can see how actually they won out in the end, and all of these parts of their program and all these parts of their plan actually get enacted. And, and then <clears throat> I was wondering that this success in failure or this failure in success that they, that they knew after uh, they fused with the Democrats in 1896, as you said, when William Jennings Bryan ran on a so-called demo pop ticket uh, against William McKinley, um, that this also leaves a very important legacy for what you could call American liberals throughout the 20th century. That even if you're not on the radical Democrat side or if you're not an American Jacobin, as you would like to call yourself, there is still a sense in which <laughs> that's, populism that's, is... That's what they were called, by the way, yeah. all, all the time. We're, we're going to get into that in a second here. It's, it's fascinating. We even got an illustration of it. Uh, but, so as you say, they were intensely vilified in their own time. So maybe we can speak about that first. Yes. And secondly, they were also treated as a worthy precedent for all the reform efforts that we saw throughout the 20th century when populism was for a long time just an exclusively American concept. And it was only later in the 20th century that uh, yes. all kinds of social science. And we're gonna, we're gonna, talk, we're gonna talk about that because that's uh, all of these, everything you mentioned is really, really yeah. interesting. And, uh, but so there's basically two legacies of populism. One is, is, is the political one that we just mentioned, all the reforms that they proposed. And these reforms eventually uh, came to pass, but uh, the populist, party was long gone by the time they uh, these reforms were instituted the other one is really interesting and that's the sort that's the anti-populist tradition and that is still with us today it's alive and well and here's how it here's how it came about so as you mentioned the uh, uh, the uh, well the populist party at first looked like it was like it was going places it was growing by leaps and bounds uh, in the 1890s the country went into a terrible depression. Uh, there were huge strikes, uh, like the Pullman strike uh, out of Chicago. Eugene Debs was the leader of it, who later became a populist. Uh, you had the first ever march on Washington, led by a populist from Ohio, a guy called 
Coxie. They called it Coxie's Army. It was a march of unemployed people on Washington, D.C. And uh, it looked like populism was, uh, was the coming movement. It looked like they were very well positioned to take advantage of, uh, of, of uh, all of the discontent that was sort of abroad in the land. And then a really crazy thing happened. In 1896, the Democratic Party met for their convention in Chicago. And they proceeded, there was the, the president of the United States at the time was a Democrat. It was Grover Cleveland, very conservative Democrat. At the time, the Democrats were not all that different from the Republicans. They fought about little issues here and there, but uh, uh, he was very conservative Democrat. The Democratic Party meets in their convention in Chicago and basically throws uh, Cleveland overboard and then <laughs> turns against the gold standard to the incredible, to the shock and uh, incredulity of the entire country or of the I should say of the sort of elite classes of the entire country and then <laughs> the shock of shocks they nominate this guy uh, William Jennings Bryan 36 years old one term congressman from Nebraska they nominate this guy for president on the uh, on the basis of a speech that he's just given denouncing the gold standard this is the famous cross of gold uh, speech. Here I got, I have some visual, we have some illustrations here. There he is, William Jennings Bryan holding the cross of gold and the crown of thorns, etc. cetera. And uh, uh, Bryan, you know, is this man with this incredible oratorical gift. Uh, and uh, anyhow, he's the man of the moment. The populist party then meets in their convention uh, a few weeks later and they say, well, you know, a lot of them know Brian personally because he's from Nebraska. He talks like a populist. He uses their sort of patented vocabulary. And he's with them on this one big issue of currency reform. He's against, he's been, de you know, he denouncing, the, denouncing the gold standard. And so they say, well, he's not with us on these other issues. You know, the populists have a whole bunch of reform ideas and Brian doesn't share any of those, but he is with them on this one big issue of the currency. And so they decide meeting in their convention, they decide that they're going to get on board uh, the Brian train <laughs> and they're going to endorse the Democratic candidate for the presidency, William Jennings Bryan. Now, wait, don't show these yet. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some context so that we can understand these political cartoons. These are very, they're very amusing in this context. So they do this and, uh, you know, at first it looks like Brian is is going to win. He's this, uh, you know, he's this kind of Lincoln character. He is a man of destiny. And then the Republicans, what happens is the entire sort of upper class of America comes together in this great gathering of the tribes of the elite uh, against Brian. They come together against him in this unprecedented way. And when I say the elite, I mean all of them. So uh, uh, academics, scholars, sociologists, lawyers, uh, uh, economists, of course, university presidents, society preachers come together with uh, the tycoons, the millionaires, the railroad barons of the era, and of course, the newspapers who are, uh, uh, you know, have this unanimously anti-Brian line. And they invent, uh, and then of course the Republican Party, which uh, amasses, which, which uh, you know, contrives to amass the greatest uh, campaign treasury basically of all time. If you adjust for, um, not just for inflation, but also for, uh, as a percentage of GDP, they spend the most on a presidential campaign that has ever been spent. The Republican Party. This is uh, William McKinley is the nominee, but he's a cipher. The real power is a man called Mark Hanna, who is a tycoon from Cleveland, Ohio, and Hanna is a a, a political genius. He's not not surprisingly, he's sort of a um, a figure that Karl Rove, among others, really admires. Um, uh, Karl Rove, by the way, has written a whole book about this election, the campaign between McKinley and Bryan. Uh, it's one of the sources that I used in, in writing this book. But um, they come together against Bryan and they build a kind of stereotype against him to, to describe what is wrong with Bryan. And they say, well, Bryan is uh, he's mentally ill. Uh, you know, he is anti-intellectual. He's talking about economics and he knows nothing about economics. He has his crackpot theory about, you know, that he, the gold standard is the uh, pillar 
of the world economy. This is what holds up the whole edifice. And he is an, you know, he's an anti-intellectual because he doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand modernize, modernization. He doesn't understand globalization. Uh, and these farmers who support him are these kind of, you know, uh, complete rabble. These are l basically low, a lower breed of humanity. These farmers out in Kansas, these farmers who are so enthusiastic about the Bryan campaign. A and uh, the whole campaign becomes this uh, uh, effort to keep the rabble in their place, to teach ordinary people that they really should have no say in the sort of uh, larger question of how the economy should be run. That this is, this is a campaign between... Um, orthodoxy and correctness and you know the, the ruling class of America, the rightful uh, hierarchs, the rightful elites of America versus uh, uh, demagogues and the rabble who want to try to uh, you know rise above their place. Now let's look at some of those pictures. Let's uh, can we see so this is here you go. here's the American Jacobin. He's got on a French Revolution uh, uh, Liberty cap. Uh, his, uh, he's wearing the cap is labeled anarchy. He's holding the knife of murder and the torch of ruin. And his name, as you can see from his cape is populism. And this is the fascinating thing. The elite of America. And by the way, this is in a humor magazine populism. You'll see has capital on the run here in the United States. Has it come to this? How could this be happening in the year 1896 that uh, capital is going to be overthrown right here in America? And this is the great fear. This is in a, a New York humor magazine called Judge, which is a, a magazine strictly of the elite if you look at the ads. Um, and also I should say, uh, I should point out here, a very racist magazine. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to do the research on anti-populism sometimes because as you sort of flip through these magazines, the racist cartoons and the racist jokes and the anti-immigrant jokes are so monstrous. And I should say the anti-Semitic anti jokes are so monstrous and so vile. Let's look at one of them. They actually, and sometimes they bleed over. This is William Jennings Bryan as an Italian immigrant anarchist. You can tell it's Brian because they've written his name on his belt and Brian has just assassinated Lady Liberty. Okay, this is the kind of stuff they were putting out to stop uh, what they called populism. He's holding the knife of repudiation in his hand. It's kind of monstrous. Let's look at the next one. Uh, oh, this is McKinley and Miss Gold Standard. He's uh, being escorted by two stout policemen down... And through anarchy slum and populist alley and the, the various characters surrounding him, you can see Mary Elizabeth Lease, uh, the, the woman in the, in the picture, not the, not Miss Gold Standard, the sort of high toned uh, upper class woman, but the, the uh, angry looking one in between the two policemen. She was a leader of the populist party in Kansas. Off to the right, you can see a man who is known Sockless Jerry Simpson, another Kansas populist. And to the right of him is the governor of Illinois, John P. Altgeld. Uh, and uh, this is a this is how they they uh, you know this is this is how they understood police back then. Police were there to keep the rabble in line. The rabble being the sort of lower class. Uh, uh, politics of populism. The police were there to protect the good. Let's see another one with cops. Let's have another image of the police. Yeah, here they are. Here's here's the uh, here's the rabble again. You've got the populists. You've got three figures in the front. I love this little triptych: uh, riot, repudiation, and populism. Populism is the one wearing the glasses, and they are uh, they're acclaiming their demagogue hero, William Jennings Bryan. You see, they they're waving the red flag of repudiation. And they are the, you know, this is, this is it. This is what populism signifies. This is the horror of it. Um, the masses, you know, want, basically they want free shit. They want to overthrow everything. They want to bring down uh, the mighty they, or the bring down the, the, you know, society's upper class. But thank goodness, the, uh, <laughs> the sound money police, as the caption puts it, are closing in on William Jennings Bryan and his, uh, and his, his anarchic, uh, supporters. So that's the class war circa 1896. And it is, a, it is amazing to me that the ruling class of this country really persuaded themselves that that's what was happening. Let's see the, the pamphlet by John Hay. Can you flip, throw that one up there? Yeah, this is, uh, th so the, uh, the Republican campaign 
put out a blizzard of literary materials all over America. This is one of the most famous of the pamphlets that they put out this year, The Platform of Anarchy uh, by John Hay. John Hay had been uh, uh, had been a, a, a secretary of, to Abraham Lincoln and then had become a kind of man of letters. He was a very prominent Republican uh, advisor to McKinley. And this is his denunciation of populism. Uh, and of the Democratic Party, which he argued had been swallowed by the Populist Party, and now here, take 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 that down. The uh, the uh, here's the point. This is anti-populism. This campaign against against Brian. But people like John Hay, what they said is that it's not the Democratic Party that we're up against. It's this larger phenomenon that we describe with the word populism. Now. As uh, any historian can tell you, populism was not really about uh, anarchy. It wasn't really about uh, uh, anti-intellectualism. It wasn't really a movement led by demagogues. You know, it wasn't really a movement that that wanted to overthrow everything that was righteous and holy and good about society. That's what the Republicans said about it, but that was just propaganda. That wasn't really true. But that was the great anti-populist stereotype. Now that should sound, if you've been paying attention to the newspapers and the you know, uh, uh, magazines and, you know, the sort of pundit, uh, uh, pundit speak for the last four years, that should sound a little familiar to you. <laughs> yes, because it's exactly the same thing today. They're using the exact same stereotype. This is what populism is supposed to be all over again. Uh, do the, the, the I, I love the one of the, uh, the airliner. Yes, here we go. This is in the New Yorker magazine. Uh, the Folly of Democracy is the, the is my caption for it. I don't think that's the actual title. It's actually kind of a funny picture. But the idea that is that populism is this uprising of ordinary people against expertise. It's this uh, uh, democracy where there should not be. It's democracy out of control basically. And we see it here in the most unimaginable circumstance, passengers mutinying against the uh, the pilot of the airplane. Okay. Enough illustrations. Okay, Anton, I'm I'm exhausted. What do you perfect. what else you got? No, perfect. Thanks for this very rich tour of the anti-populist demonology, certainly in the late 19th century. But I think we can we can trace the relevance of what you're showing here also for today. But mainly I want to zoom out more further and just look at how did we get there from the late 19th century yeah. until the early 21st century and look more specifically at how populism as a movement was received by academics but also how the populist legacy could shoot into all kinds of unpredictable directions. And the first is about the legacy of anti-populism, where once a specific kind of anti-populism finds its place in the academy in the post-war years, yes. uh, as you discussed in one chapter on Richard Hofstadter, um, this also gives anti-populism a new intellectual veneer it didn't have before, because as you say, some of the objections to populism in the late 19th century were uh, were incredibly crude and were not particularly sophisticated, but there is something about that. But, the, but they moment. were they were sophisticated by the standards of the day. This is it's important mm. to remember that. So eugenics was that was the, like that was accepted stuff. They were um, one of the mag one of the things that I found was a, de a series of denunciations of populism by William Graham Sumner, who is the great social Darwinist thinker of the, of the eighteen nineties. There was no one more sophisticated than William Graham Sumner uh, in 1896. He was the like the most um, respected scholar of any anything in the United States in that period. And here he is writing for a popular magazine in 1896, denouncing populism. Uh, and you, you find economists doing the same thing. You find there was a, a psychologist that wrote for the the New York Times. He was anonymous. Uh, he called himself alienist, which was a term for a psychologist at the time, who said that William Jennings Bryan was in the grip of paran. Uh, you know, he, he was mentally ill. He was in the grip of a par of paranoia. Um, it, you know, we, he couldn't put his finger precisely on what the psychological ailment was, but this was this was commonplace, and by the standards of the 1890s, it it was sophisticated. But Anton, you ask exactly the right question, which is yeah. how did that smear campaign from 1896? Why is it still going today? You know, nobody remembers those cartoons. When I went to do the research for this book, I really had to dig to to find those cartoons. I mean, I actually, as we were talking before the show started, I had to physically buy copies of these old magazines in order to get the uh, the get the cartoons. How did it? Does it? How is it that 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 stereotype is still going today? And that's the that is the central question of the book. And it the 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 moment. Um, 
is the, you know where this this stereotype gets sort of uh, refreshed for the modern era. This happens in the 1950s with this new generation of scholars who are coming up. Uh, they called themselves, or I don't know if they called themselves this, but they were referred to as the consensus intellectuals. Um, you probably, you know, I, I, I imagine this is a pretty um, uh, a well-educated group that's listening to us right now. So they're probably familiar with Richard Hofstadter, uh, Daniel Bell, that sort of uh, that sort of thinker, and the idea, the the sort of guiding idea of this group of intellectuals is that um, dissent was a kind of dysfunction. And there, in in American history, we had never really disagreed about any of the big things. American history had been a history of consensus, and so groups like populism and like the labor movement and like uh, various other movements in our history posed a real problem for the for these guys and for their understanding of American history. And in 1955, Richard Hofstadter, who is the greatest his, American historian of his, of his era, uh, probably one of the greatest American historians of them all, Richard Hofstadter publishes his magnum opus. It's called The Age of Reform. He wins the Pulitzer Prize. It's a bestseller. It's enormously influential. It's been described as the most influential work of American history of all time. And it's a reinterpretation uh, of the reform tradition in American life, beginning with populism. And the book is basically, it's a prolonged attack on populism. And he takes those stereotypes from 1896 and uh, recasts them in highbrow psychological language of the 1950s, sort of trendy psychological theories of the 1950s. And he tells us that populism is, um, it's a uh, populism was a movement of people who were going downward in status. And because they were going downward in status, they had status anxiety uh, and they suffered from all sorts of pathologies associated with that. They were uh, resentful of people in big cities. They didn't understand uh, complicated ideas or global phenomenon. And, and so they were um, they were uh, anti, they were xenophobic, they were anti-immigrant, they were, uh, they were anti-Semitic, he tells us, they were uh, anti-intellectual, uh, they were given to conspiracy theories, um, you know, because they couldn't understand reality as it actually was, they couldn't understand complex reality. But above all, they were, uh, uh, well, basically, I'm sorry, I'm missing the main point here about Hofstetter, suddenly it's, suddenly it's, uh, it's disappeared from my brain. Anton? <clears throat> no, insofar as like what was specific about the way um, pop uh, Hofstadter cast late 19th century populism uh, as a movement that also preceded or that was a precedent to McCarthyism, for example. Yes. But there was something distinctly powerful, certainly for liberals or for the way liberals looked at concepts such as the people or popular sovereignty um, that they could take away from Hofstadter's vision. So as you say, you gave an overview of the anti-populist tradition in the late 19th century, but what Hofstadter does is that he gives that anti-populist tradition a particular intellectual weight and force it didn't have. Yes, and, and we should we should point out here that Hofstadter never acknowledges that he uh, that that he's that he's riffing on a stereotype from 1896. He never acknowledges that. Although it's look, he would have been a really awful historian if he didn't know about, for example, those images that you and I just showed. He would if he didn't know about that. I don't know how. You know, you could write about populism and not know about that stuff. Uh, and certainly he knew about someone like William Graham Sumner because he wrote a whole book about William Graham. His mm -hmm. first his dissertation was about mm -hmm. William Graham, Graham Sumner. So he knew about the anti-populist tradition of the 1890s. He never mentions it anywhere. He's the, the whole uh, sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, idea of of. Um, the age of reform is that Hofstadter is doing this brand new interpretation mm. of populism and is taking it down from its pedestal as a reform movement and pointing out that in fact, it has all of these psychological problems. And uh, here's the thing, Hofstadter's, um, Hofstadter's vision of populism is massively refuted by the American historical profession and various other academics. We'll get into that in a second. It's massively refuted, but at the same time, it catches on. 
in a huge way. Mm -hmm. It uh, it captures the mind of academia, and within uh, a, a year, the word populism is being used as a generic term by other members of the consensus school to uh, uh, you know to understand uh, uh, sort of proto-fascist demagoguery in general. There's a, a sociologist at the University of Chicago called Edward Schills who writes mm -hmm. a book about this. Uh, it comes out, you know, in 1956. You have Seymour Lipset is using it. Mm -hmm. Daniel Bell is using it. All of these books are using the word populism immediately, uh, thinking that Hofstadter has proven this, this, uh, you know, this amazing thing that movements that appear to be reform movements, in fact, harbor these really authoritarian. Um, uh, tendencies that they're in fact really, really dangerous, and they start using the word, uh, and it, it it catches on immediately. Now, let's take a step back. Hofstadter is also very quickly refuted by the American mm -hmm. historical profession, and this is a uh, uh, you know if you study history. Uh, in this country, or if you study this period in this country, uh, you, you learn this right away. It's one of the most famous historical debates. Uh, people refute him with, there's book-length studies refuting Hofstadter. Here's one of them. This is a particularly good one. Uh, there's uh, yeah, People refute like single paragraphs of Hofstadter, write entire books refuting mm -hmm. it. There's one about, about Kansas populism called the tolerant populist that points out they were in no way uh, xenophobic. This is a complete uh, misunderstanding of populism. They they weren't anti-Semitic. You know, a guy writes a book about that one. And and you we actually showed you evidence uh, that, in fact, it was the anti-populists who were the real xenophobes in American mm -hmm. society in the 1890s. You know, Hofstadter has the picture. He's not only wrong, he has it completely upside down. The populists were the tolerant ones at the time. So Hofstadter has built a intellectual edifice that's a, a whole sort of pedagogy that's completely wrong, but that catches on in a huge way. Why? Yeah. So, so that's the question. That's the question that's that I'm question grappling well, yeah. with. Yeah. So that's 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 the one that I that that's the question that I'm I'm proudest of. Uh, answering in, in, in my book, the people know, why does this idea catch on? And this is, this is, this is the point. This is the answer that, that I eventually came to. It's that Hofstadter wasn't just writing a critique of, of populism. He's also writing a manifesto for his own class, for his own cohort of intellectuals. Okay. The 1950s, is you know the 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 consensus intellectuals this is the great period of managerialism in american life the whole managerial philosophy is taking off and is conquering the world at this point you know the man in the gray flannel suit uh, the organization man etc this is when the american university system is expanding in this enormous way this is when mbas are starting to run the great american corporations phd's are running all the big departments in Washington, uh, these guys, and they, they, by the way, this is always a theme with this group of intellectuals, someone like Daniel Bell, they love to write and talk about the triumph of their cohort. Um, and I remember that, it, and it's, you know, what one hell of a triumph. One of the great, the, their greatest triumph was Robert McNamara, you know, at the Pentagon, Robert McNamara, who was the sort of uh, golden boy of managerialism, the great genius CEO of the Ford Motor Company, who then gets installed at the Pentagon and is running the Defense Department and who dreams up the Vietnam War. Anyhow, these are this is the great golden age of managerialism. And what Hofstadter and his friends are doing is writing these manifestos for their class of people, for this new elite that is rising up. OK, and they want to understand they need a word to understand what they are displacing, the reform tradition that they are displacing. And the whole idea of the age of reform, Hofstadter's title, you know, his great uh, magnum opus, the whole idea of it is that reform from the bottom up, reform by mass movements of working class people like populism, like the CIO, like the labor movement, that this is a dead end. This is a, a road you do not want to go down because it leads to authoritarianism. It leads to status anxiety. It leads to, uh, you know, uh, all of it leads to McCarthyism. It leads to these terrible proto-fascist things. But reform from the top down, reform by people with PhDs, reform by a bunch of uh, white collar, affluent white collar people, lobbyists, let's say, sitting around a big mahogany table in Washington, D.C. and hammering out the decisions by themselves. That works. 
according to Hofstadter. And in 1955, that was a that was a very popular idea. It was a very seductive idea. You could have a managed economy that delivered prosperity. You know, you think of uh, of Galbraith. You know, his idea of the new industrial state. You could have okay, that's not the 50s, but you get the you get the point. You could have uh, these people would they'd not only manage the economy, they'd manage the Pentagon, they'd manage the, the the global Cold War against communism, and they would deliver victory. You know, the 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 discipline of political science would do this for you. This was the fantasy of the age, and anti-populism was a important component of it. They used the word populism to describe what was not them, to describe why the opposition to they themselves was illegitimate, why this status hierarchy that they were on top of was a legitimate hierarchy, was a fair hierarchy, was a just hierarchy. And what I finally concluded, and I'm going to shut up here, Anton, I promise I'm shutting up, mm -hmm. but they, what they finally concluded, what everybody who uses uh, the sort of anti-populist idea, the anti-populist mm -hmm. stereotype, is it's always to justify their exalted place in, in the hierarchy. Always. And you see that again today. So my question is going to be more direct and aimed at these contemporary debates. Um, if you think that so many of our uses of the contemporary word populism are contaminated or at least informed by Hofstadter, and are therefore historically at least efficient because they shut out that other historical legacy. Um, what would semantic hygiene really look like when we use the word today? Um, because okay, clearly, so if, I, we, if we look at Europe today and the word, the, the way the word populism is used, and it's something I find almost irresistible as well, it does seem to capture a very, very deep dimension of what exactly has been going on in the last ten years, which has been called the populist decade across uh, across the board, really. And you yourself gave the example of the book of saying, well, someone like Donald Trump might have pseudo populist rhetoric, like on a superficial level, there might be yeah. some similarity with a given American populist tradition, but in content and when it comes to policy, Trump is hardly a populist. It is actually- Oh yeah, I mean, oh my God. Yeah. But what is, what is a good alternative then? What word should we be well, using? Okay, so look, and should I, we just ban the word from our vocabulary in a certain way or, or do you think <laughs> that this kind of moratorium is not going to get us anywhere? That so Anton, I just got, I got to say right away, I like, I like that phrase you use semantic hygiene, but I, I have to immediately say, that's not me. I, I am not the language police. Uh, I am never going to be the one that tells people they have to stop using word. It annoys me. And I remember when I first ended, and it, and this is sort of where the conversation started. It annoys people that I know from Kansas who just, every time they hear that, it just makes their skin crawl. They can't believe that the word is being abused in this way. And, and, uh, but I think it might have gone too far for someone like me to correct or someone like you to correct. I don't think that this word is recoverable. However, um, uh, we can, I mean, look, I want people to study the sort of global right-wing turn. I want people, that's what I've spent my life doing. I want people to understand uh, what's gone wrong for for our society, you know, and, and why the, you know, why the right is on the march everywhere that you look. I want yeah, to understand- can I just interject insofar as you yeah. yourself written a book with the word market populism in it originally? Yes, I did. And as, a, as a term, it was kind of inevitable and it was also very insightful because it does did seem to make sense of a very- But, but I always I also kind of, said always that it was a phony. It's it's a yes, phony populism. Yeah. It's so you, you'd, using... be willing to, you'd be willing to defend that usage today, you would say, right? Yeah, because it's a it's a it's a great terminology, and what I meant by it, and 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 by the way, and I use the word I use mm. the phrase phony populism all the time to this day mm. because it does capture it gets at what someone like Donald Trump is doing. But it's the, here's the critical thing, Anton. It doesn't start with Donald Trump, and it doesn't start with Marine Le Pen. Yeah. It's it, this is a a long tradition in American life, and it. It is bound into this story. It is part of this story because as the uh, liberalism and the you know the Democratic Party in America start to under identify themselves with this kind of managerial philosophy, okay, and this becomes more and more pronounced in the 1970s, where the Demo you have the Democratic Party turning their back, actually turning their backs on the labor movement, uh, and to you know now we've got this point where they identify openly and overtly with the. Um, 
Mm -hmm. sort of white collar class, very affluent suburbanites. You know, that's who Biden is trying to win over this year. And, and he's going to have some, and that's where Hillary had this amazing success in 2016. So as that happened, uh, the, uh, uh, the Republicans and the right wing in this country said, wait a second, look at what they're, look at what they're giving up. Look at what they are abandoning to us. And you, you can see the light bulb go on in the head of someone like Richard Nixon or someone like Lee Atwater or someone like uh, who was the, the sort of uh, the, the, the genius behind Ronald Reagan. Uh, the name escapes me at the moment. But all of these people or, or Steve Bannon, right, they can see this happening and they're like, look at what the Democrats are giving up. Let's go out there and take it. And so you have these conservative politicians, this great move to the right has been driven by this kind of rhetoric. Uh, this workerist uh, rhetoric, this pseudo-democratic, pseudo-populist rhetoric, where you have you know all of these conservative pop, uh, politicians reaching out for uh, working-class voters, specifically white working-class voters, using all of these different uh, uh, techniques for reaching out to them, and and with you know having enormous success doing it. And so the 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 you know look, I'm not a um, I'm not the language police. I'm never going to have that kind of power. I don't even have that desire. I think the word has gone too far to recover it now, but you know, I'll be damned if I'm ever going to use it that way. What I want to point out in this book is something I want to, you know, try to understand uh, that anti-populism is not the way forward and that the only way you're going to beat the right wing, the only way you're going to reverse these advances permanently. I mean, I think Joe Biden will probably beat Donald Trump this fall just because Trump has fucked up so incredibly, massively, you know, horribly, right? I think I think Biden's probably going to win. The only way you're going to defeat these guys permanently is by recapturing the populist mm. tradition in this country, the genuine populist tradition. And whether you have to use that word to understand it or whether you just have to understand the history of what's gone wrong. Yeah. Uh, either way, it's okay with me <laughs> as long as we get back to the, as long as we get back to what we need to get back to. Yeah. So the hour is running, running away. So we're going to, I'm, be I'm so questions. sorry. I talk no, so no much. It's fine. No worries. There's a lot to talk about in general. Um, so we're going to be taking questions from the digital floor. So people do put your questions in the chat. But we already have a first question from Noam Daganov specifically. And it's a very direct question, which also speaks to what we are talking about just now, which is, can you be against Medicare for all and still be a populist? Basically, is there, such a, is, there such a thing, is there such a thing as right wing populism? So it speaks directly to this question of pseudo or phony populism and what are the world is. So, I, so my my definition of it, and this is based on the uh, you know not only the populist party in the 1890s, but the New Deal on, and you know, the the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King, by the way, famously in 1965 did a big shout out to populism. He clearly saw himself as uh, as standing as having something to do with that tradition. I don't think he would have actually called himself a populist, but uh, understood that tradition. Anyhow, when you look at these these uh, historical examples, my definition of it is a, uh, a, a movement of working class people from all different uh, races, walks of life, backgrounds in favor of economic democracy. And the key there is economic democracy. If you're not in favor of that, of, you know, of, of, of building, a, a, you know, economic democracy, then it's not it's not really populism. Uh, Medicare for all. I'm really glad somebody asked about this. I could talk about this all, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep it real short here because, uh, you know, when, you know, when this pandemic broke, everybody was saying, you know, populism, which is this anti-intellectual, anti-expertise tradition is going to kill us all because they're telling us not to listen to doctors. And this just, it, it just drove me up the wall when I, you know, after I read like the 20th story making this point, and I decided to go out and do a little research on what populism actually thought about healthcare. And once you go out and do this research, there are lots of people in the populist tradition in America who had a lot to say about healthcare and about how it should be delivered. And, uh, you know, big surprise here. They shot it. Should they, they thought it should be accessible to everyone. They would put together, you know, co farmers collectives where they would they would, uh, you know, uh, farmers in Oklahoma would be able to get health care. You know, it wouldn't be too expensive for them and stuff like that. Here's the funniest thing I found out. Funniest, maybe most surprising thing. After the Populist Party died in America, it continued in Canada. 
I didn't even know this until I'd already turned in the book. And so I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't do the research on this for the book, but it continued in Canada on the, in the Plains provinces in Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba and Alberta, places like that, the sort of populist political tradition. And in Saskatchewan, they actually took power in the 1940s. Uh, it, it was, they called themselves the first socialist. What was it? Wait, what was the name of the party? The Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. Cooperative Commonwealth, Anton, as you know, was the populists' word for their utopia, the Cooperative Commonwealth. And so there was this party in Canada that used that old phrase as their name of the party. Mm -hmm. This party is the vehicle that eventually delivered universal health care in Canada. They called it Medicare. And here's the funny point you know who opposed? not only Medicare in Canada, but who opposed every effort to build universal health care in America from that, that farmer's collective in Oklahoma up to Harry Truman proposing it in 1948. The experts, medical doctors, the American Medical Association, this is the big bad opponent of universal health care, of Medicare for all. And when they finally proposed it in Canada and got it, they, you know, when this, this party in Canada finally said, we're going to do this, we won the election and we're going to build a system of universal health care right here in Saskatchewan, the doctors of Saskatchewan went on strike. The experts went on strike. It was a full on Ayn Rand moment of the top, you know, the, the elite saying, you know, we're going to make these farmers and workers get back in line. And um, uh, fortunately for us, the, uh, the populists won that particular battle. And now everyone in Canada has, they have a good universal health care system. How's so that for an answer? They, they <laughs> so it gets into interesting compatibilities between socialist and populist tradition, which we can maybe talk about in the end. But now the next question we have uh, is just about tactics or what, what is there to do? And this is, did you come across any effective responses to anti-populist tactics in your research? So I think you talk about this in the book, but not maybe practically yes. or directly insofar as what is actually to be done about anti-populism just more than recovering this populist legacy you okay. so, so, you the, so richly etilated the book as well. Two important things. One is that uh, is that is that anti-populism is, is always about is always about top down, you know, hierarchy saying get back in your get back in your place. And it was effective in 1896. It always has more money than than populism uh, proper, of course. Uh, but there's a you know There's another lesson here. There's a chapter that we didn't talk about, and that's the 1930s, where you see this weird uh, 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 recurrence of the themes from 1896, this time uh, mobilized against Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal in 1936. Uh, the Republicans, again, uh, or, or I should say, not the Republicans, but the uh, uh, the big money behind the Republican Party, uh, in this case, the DuPont family, raises and spends an enormous amount of money on something called the American Liberty League, denouncing the New Deal, denouncing Roosevelt, using a lot of the exact same attack as in 1896. And this time, it utterly goes down in flames. And Roosevelt wins re-election in one of the greatest triumphs in American history, this overwhelming landslide, you know. And so I'm here to tell you that anti-populism not only uh, can be beaten, but can be beaten rather easily because it's it's a despicable doctrine. Uh, and Americans know it. I mean, this whole idea of... Um, of, of, you know, ordin ordinary people have to know their places and have to shut up and listen. This is, uh, this is dreadful. And it goes against everything, you know, in our culture and everything about who we are. Uh, you know, this is a very democratic country uh, and we can't stand that sort of thing. Uh, you know, e e even though we have all sorts of other problems in this country, but culturally we are so utterly, you know, deeply democratic. Uh, yeah. Anti-populism is, is a, It's a loser every time. So then the question would be, and this is about the Bernie campaign, do you think that the collective effort by the established Democrats uh, here in 2020, actually, to ensure that the populism of Bernie Sanders would not find its way into a national election kind of parallels the 1890s? So people have spoken, for example, of the first and a second Gilded Age and pretending that we live in the second while the original populists live in the first. Do you buy that analogy? Hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. Here's the anthology of the Baffler magazine. Ah, exactly. 1997, yeah. the business of culture in the new Gilded Age. I've spent my entire adult life in the new Gilded Age. <laughs> Second Gilded Age, writing about this stuff and uh, and and talking about the 1890s and uh, okay, but the question is about is about Bernie. 
look, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, one of the things I really like about him, I got to interview Sanders once in, I think, 2014. He's one of the very, very few politicians in this country who would understand everything we're talking about here in this conversation. He would totally get it. And I think one of the things that he gets, and he's shown that he gets it, is that it's not just about the leaders. Yes, the leaders go down to defeat. You know, Sanders was not a perfect leader. And, uh, and, and you know, and the Democratic Party had, you know, they beat him. I mean, let's, 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 not, let's not kid ourselves about this. But he would also tell you that it's not just about leaders, that it's about movements. Social movements are how you get things done in this country. Uh, you know, contra Richard Hofstadter, sorry, consensus intellectuals. It is uh, mass social movements of ordinary people in the streets. That's how change is made in this country. And that's the problem before us is how you go, how you, how you, how you move from having a single charismatic lot and strongly supported, how you move from that to building a full-blown social movement. And before everybody gets all depressed and sad about this, I just want to tell you, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm 55 years old. Sanders is the first time we've ever had, I, I, I thought that I would never see in my lifetime a politician that I could support wholeheartedly in this country. It was always going to be, you know, a Clinton or an Obama. Uh, and you had to, you know, accept, you know, that they were slightly better than the other guy, but they weren't really great or anything like that. But, Look at look at how far we've come that we could even have a guy like Sanders who came as close as he did uh, in 2016 and then again in 2020. I think it's I think we've made all sorts of progress. Yeah. Then following up from Sanders, who, of course, has described himself more as a democratic socialist than as a populist. There is a question, though, about the potential divergences there are between an American socialist tradition and an American populist tradition. Because as you talk about in the book, a lot of the former populists from the 1890s did go into the Socialist Party of the early 1900s. But even in the early 1900s, there were some conflicts between ex-populists and some of these new socialists who had slightly different visions of how an economy should be run or what part of the economy exactly should be democratized. And I was wondering whether you had any particular thoughts to say, like, Look, populism is still a very interesting and viable tradition. It offers immense resources for our democratic thinking today. But does it also have limits? So are there parts, for example, where maybe socialists will have different answers? Or are there any limits to the populist tradition we should be aware of today when we're trying to think about it politically again? Yes, but I would put the question the other way around. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been involved with uh, left-wing politics for a long time. And one of the problems of the left uh, chronically is sectarianism and this idea of, you know, that, uh, that, that I've got the right line and I'm going to, you know, purge everybody else from the movement. I'm going to kick everybody else out. And in a weird way, uh, it, in a weird way that has become a kind of um, that's been massified lately. Uh, and you see that everywhere in the culture nowadays in, in liberalism, this sort of uh, um, well, I call it the utopia of scolding. There is this, uh, this impulse. And this is especially now that liberalism has become a phenomenon of the, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the sort of white collar class. You know, I live here in this affluent suburb of Washington, DC, and it is a utopia of scolding with all these, um, all these people who are, you know, highly educated, uh, have really good jobs and just love wagging their finger at, at the rest of America. And for them, that's like those sort of sectarians of old. That is an end in itself. It's very satisfying. But what populism teaches us is, is, is the opposite, that the, that the way you build a mass movement is you know, if you build a mass movement, I want to go back to, and this is a good place to end. I know we're almost out of time, but uh, Larry Goodwin, one of the, gr the truly great historians of populism, uh, he came out of the civil rights movement. He would, he had been involved in, uh, uh, you know, in the civil rights movement in Texas in the 1960s, wrote a bunch of essays about it, then decided to go into academia. And he did one of the great landmark studies of populism. And after that was done, he wrote a bunch of essays sort of trying to theorize his understanding of, of populism and of the civil rights movement and of the labor movement in the 1930s. And he said, what do you have to do to, um, what do you have to do to build a mass popular movement like populism or like the civil rights movement? 
or like the labor movement in the 1930s. And he had this great line that I, that I quote in The People Know. And the line was, you have to have ideological patience. Okay, you, you can't, you know, if you're trying to build a mass movement, the people that you're going to be working with are not necessarily people who went to graduate school. Very, very, very few of them are going to be those people. Most of them are going to have had no experience of college whatsoever. They're not going to know the vocabulary. They're not going to know uh, right off the bat how you talk, what's the acceptable way. And you don't build a mass movement by purging people and scolding people. And that was his that was his lesson for us. By the way, I think uh, uh, Larry Goodwin um, was sort of I've I've since I since the book came out, since the people know came out. I'm you know we're here in COVID time, and I've had a lot of time to think about these themes. But I feel like this conflict that we're describing between pop, the populist tradition and the consensus tradition between populism and Hofstadter, it's not just. Uh, you know, one historian or one historian mm. and his group of friends. This is a running conflict in the American left and in American life more generally. Mm. And uh, it, you know, uh, one of the things Larry Goodwin talked about, he saw any movement that enshrined, uh, you know, the white collar class, whether he, you're talking about communism or whether you're talking about American managerialism, he saw these as equally rep repugnant, which is a really interesting thing. And he wrote that during the Cold War, too. Anyhow, fascinating guy. And we're out of time. Yeah, we are. So I, can, I, I can keep going if you want, but I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna advise. We're, we're, we're gonna tax. We're gonna I'm gonna buff. advise or or even urge everyone to actually read the book. I would say the Biden campaign urgently needs to read this book, but I'm afraid it, it might be too late to to turn that ship at this point. Um, yeah. But still, it's yeah. it's incredible. Well, let's let's wish wish him the best, but mm. <laughs> he'll have time. You know, yeah. I, I you know what I am I am willing to come to Joe's uh, basement uh, over there in Delaware <laughs> and 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 give him a one on one explication yeah. of the entire text. You know, yeah, I'd be I hope I, I would be happy to do it. Let's put it I that hope way. He, I hope he can leave <laughs> his basement on the election night. And maybe maybe he can read the book afterwards if he has time. Yeah. But thanks thanks so much, Thomas, for this. It was immensely stimulating. And for people who want more, there's always the book and there's always the article. There's so much more. Yes, it's yeah. a wonderful subject. And uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm.